Okay, so I'm between you and the door. So let's see if we can get started. And I'm going to talk to you today about our neonatal component. It's our new component for NHSN. It's late onset sepsis and meningitis, or LOS men. I also want to talk to you a little bit and let you know what we're doing here at NHSN. We have a new neonatal pediatric work group. We've got about 40 individuals, pediatric ID, neonatologists, pediatricians, uh, some individuals from AAP, um, IPs across the country at some of the children's hospitals. We're currently working on Chapter 17. So we're working through Chapter 17, trying to provide some specific signs and symptoms and infections that affect the neonates and the pediatrics so that you have some symptoms that are more, um, that work better for you. After that, we're gonna look at our major type infections. So we'll be looking at LCBI, pneumonia, um, VAE, well, we have VAE, but pneumonia, SSI. So we are working through this. Keep in mind, this is a two or three year project. Oh. Okay, yeah, sure. All right, so my objectives today is to provide CDC's rationale and background for bringing on late onset sepsis and meningitis under surveillance. I wanna review the data requirements and the plans for electronic detection and reporting of LOS men, numerators and denominator data. And we wanna define national uh, NHSN criteria for LOS men. So to give you a little idea of where we fit in the organization, uh, you have NHSN components. You have patient safety, which you've heard a lot of this last week. You have long-term care facilities, outpatient dialysis, healthcare personnel safety where your flu vaccines are reported, biovigilance, our new outpatient procedure, and now we'll have neonatal. Neonatal, again, will have two, mod two modules. They're in the same module, but it'll be late onset sepsis and meningitis. And they have four criteria. They have an NLCBI1, an NLCBI2, and an L NLCM1, and an NLCM2. There will be future modules. We've talked about early onset sepsis and we've talked about uh, doing necrotizing intercolitis. So the rationale, so for late onset sepsis, 36 of extremely low gestational age infants develop late onset sepsis. 21% of those low birth weight infants who survive beyond three days develop late onset sepsis. And one third of late onset sepsis events are not associated with central lines. Meningitis occurs in 23% of our bacteremic infants 38% of the infants with a pathogen from CSF may not have an organism isolated from the blood. We've also never tracked meningitis. So this will be new. We'll be able to track meningitis now. The background, we began work on this component in 2015. We collaborated with Vermont Oxford Network or Vaughn and other key stakeholders in the development of this protocol. Data collection was completed in three healthcare facilities. They were children's hospitals, and we did data co collection on 300 medical records. This will be the first electronic data collection module for NHSN that's an HAI module. And it was developed with electronic capture in mind. There will be no manual data entry available. Yes, we did it for you. So our goal was this allows IPs to spend time on prevention instead of surveillance and data entry. And IPs and facilities, you'll be able to view your data and your line listing in order to implement your prevention activities. So planning for this, it'll be released. We're planning to release this summer of 2020. We will be adding a level four nursery for children's hospitals, and that'll be added for risk adjustment starting in January of 2020. 
And again, there's additional modules to come. So I'm going to show you a little diagram here of what we're thinking and how we're planning for this to happen. So you'll have facilities, electronic medical record, and we'll extract the data. And we'll talk about those data components in a few minutes. Then it'll go to a vendor reporting system. You may have one in your facility. There's many out there. And it'll either go two ways. From the vendor system, it'll go straight to the CDC, um, CDA upload to NHSN, or we have developed a calculator for LOS men that will help determine the event and it'll provide the labels for numerator and denominator. So it will all, it'll be both numerator and denominator. It goes back to the vending reported system and then it'll go to the CDA. So we'll talk a little bit about the module and the definition. So the definition is a lab-confirmed bloodstream infection or lab-confirmed meningitis caused by a fungal or bacterial organism in an eligible neonate who is older than day of life 3 but younger than day of life 121 on the date of the event. And just to clarify, the day of birth, regardless of the time of birth, is defined as day of life 1. You may be born at 11.59. That's going to be p.m. That's going to be day of life one. So an eligible infant, birth weight is 401 to 1,500 grams. Gestational age is 22 weeks and zero days to 29 weeks and six days. And again, they're older than day of life three younger than day of life 121 with birth date regardless of the time of birth as being day of life one. So the surveillance settings will be a level four neonatal intensive care unit, a level three neonatal intensive care unit, and a level two, three intermediate or step down neonatal intensive care unit. Those are defined by your facility CCN. I'm going to show you some of the definitions that are defined by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And we won't go through these specifically, but a level uh, two, three is a mixed acuity unit, houses both level two, three neonates. And a level three has the capabilities of a level two, plus they have more capabilities. Uh, comprehensive care for newborns that are less than 32 weeks and less than 1500 grams. And then our new one really applies more to your regional NICUs, and it has all the level three capabilities, but it's located in an institution that can provide surgical repair for complex congenital and acquired conditions. It maintains a full range of pediatric medical subspecialists, pediatric surgical subspecialists at the site, and the facility transport and provide outreach education to the community and other facilities. So key terms, date of the event. Date of the event is a collection date of the first blood or CSF specimen from which an organism is identified by culture or non-culture based microbiological testing performed for the purposes of clinical diagnosis and treatment. Active surveillance cultures would not be considered. A central line is considered present at the time of the LOS men event if it is in place for greater than two days on the day of the infection event. A central line, again, is an intravascular catheter that terminates at or close to the heart or in one of the great vessels. Central line field is optional. So it's not mandatory that we pick up that field. It's nice for you to be able to see that if we can electronically capture that, but it's not necessary. Repeat infection time frame. The infant may have one episode of LOS men during a single hospitalization, but there is a 14-day RIT in which no new infection of the same type can be reported. However, you can have an LOS and you can have a men event during the same 14-day time frame. They're not the same. They're two different infections. Transfer rule. If the date of the event occurs on the date of transfer, to a receiving facility or the next day, the infection event will be identified by the receiving facility as present on admission. However, 
facilities will not be able to capture post-discharge events. So if you transfer someone, a neonate, to another facility and they have a positive blood culture on day one or two of transfer, you will not be able to call that infection in your facility being the transferring facility. We know those are going to fall out. <clears throat> and that's because you don't have the ability to capture it electronically. Okay, so we'll look at the events. I've mentioned NLCBI1 I've in, and NLCM1. So late onset sepsis has two events, neonatal lab confirmed bloodstream infection one, a neonatal lab confirmed bloodstream infection two. Meningitis has a neonatal lab confirmed meningitis one and a neonatal lab confirmed meningitis two. So let's talk about the lab confirmed bloodstream infection. It's a recognized pathogen, which is not a common commensal, identified from one or more blood specimens obtained from an infant and tested by non-culture or culture-based microbiological testing method, performed for purposes of clinical diagnosis and treatment. Again, not for purposes of active surveillance. So we will have a special organism list for neonates for this uh, protocol. You'll go to supporting material. You'll go down to NHSN organism list, all organisms, and then down at the bottom, one of the tabs, it'll be listed down there. So you'll be able to access that. Neonatal lab confirmed bloodstream infection two is a common commensal identified from one or more blood specimens by culture or non-culture based microbiological testing and is performed for purposes of clinical diagnosis and treatment. We know we are missing common commensals. So this is a way for us to be able to capture those bloodstream infections that are caused by common commensals. And in addition to that, there'll be treatment of one or more new antimicrobial agents continued for five or more calendar days in accordance with NHSN's definition of QADs. So let's talk about QADs. QADs are days on which antimicrobial agents is administered. The antimicrobial agent must start within two days before or two days after the collection date of the positive blood or CFS specimen and may not be administered within two days prior to the start date. Days between administration of a new antimicrobial agent also count, as long as there's no more than one gap date between the administration. And substitution of a different antimicrobial agent due to therapy organism sensitivity still meets the requirements of QADs. It's much like VAE, So a new antimicrobial agent must meet all three criteria. They must be listed in the protocol. There are specific antimicrobial agents that are listed in the protocol, and I'll share those with you. Start date must occur within two days before or two days after the positive specimen and not administered on either of the two days prior to the start date. So these are the antimicrobial agents that we have listed. They'll be in the protocol. This is an example of a QAD. So in the following, in this example, the antimicrobial agent penicillin is not new since it was used within two days prior to the current start date within that two days before the positive culture. The start date in this example is hospital day five. Antimicrobials administered before day of life four cannot be used to meet NLCBI2 or NLCBI or NLCM2, excuse me. And just to note, this antimicrobial would have, this therapy that started on day five would have been acceptable even with the gap day on hospital day nine or day of life nine. 
We skipped a day with the vancomycin. Okay. So you can see here. All right. So another example of not new is we have a positive blood specimen on April 9th, day of life 36. And then we didn't start an antimicrobial until day of life 39 or April 12th. So because it was started after the two days of the spositive blood specimen, it is not considered a qualifying antimicrobial day. This one is considered new. So we had a positive blood specimen for strep viridans on May 3rd, day of life 66. It was, and we started genomycin on May 2nd, and we continued it for three days, and then we substituted with uh, ampicillin. All right, so we'll go to neonatal confirmed meningitis, or NLCM1. It is an NHSN recognized pathogen, which is not a common commensal, identified from a cerebral spinal fluid specimen obtained from an infant and tested by culture or non-culture based microbiological testing and performed for purposes of a clinical diagnosis and treatment. We have an NLCM2, and that is an NHSN common commensal and is identified from cerebral spinal fluid obtained from an infant and tested by culture or non-culture based microbiological testing and performed for purposes of clinical diagnosis and treatment. And again, treatment with one or more new antimicrobial agents that are continued for five or more calendar days. Okay, additional notes. Some caveats, if both NLCB, NLCBI and NLCM are met, both should be reported with an event date reported as the date of the specimen collection. If both a recognized pathogen and common commensal are isolated from a specimen, it will report an NLCBI1 or an NLCM1. The results obtained from active surveillance do not count toward meeting the criteria. Data collection. This is a little different. So LOS men's surveillance protocol is designed to enable computer-based algorithms applied to the electronic health data sources to identify infants who qualify for LOS numerator and denominator. The numerator and denominator data must be submitted to NHSN electronically, reporting manually again using the internet web-based interface is not an option. And facilities must report LOS MIN data via the electronic data standard known as clinical document architecture. So the numerator is any positive NLCBI or NLCM event during a surveillance month in an eligible infant. The denominator is based on patient location and includes all eligible infants. And again, the locations will be a level two, three, a level three, and a level four nursery. Each infant in a location will count one time during the month. So it's not patient days, they'll count once. If they're transferred to another location in the calendar month, They'll count once in the previous location and once in the new location. And this is the denominator form. We have to do forms in order to do the implementation guide. So this is a form. Uh, birth weight is going to be mandatory. Gestational age is mandatory. So those are two things that we will be obtaining. All right, so data analysis will be different as well. So data analysis, our first measure will be crude monthly risk. So our crude monthly risk equals the number of LOS men events 
over the number of eligible neonates in each location and month. So how many babies resided in that location for that month? And again, they count one time. So suppose you have one event and 20 neonates in that given location and month. Your crude monthly risk would be equal to 1 over 20 or 0 0.05 or 5% for the month. This is not a comparative measure. This is a one-time monthly snapshot. Cumulative risk, uh, cumulative admission risk is the number of LOS men events divided by the number of eligible neonatal admissions. So a baby just for instance, maybe in your level three nursery, first five days of the month, got a little bit better, came off the vent, they moved them to the level two, three. Well, they crashed. So we needed to move them back to level three. That baby's going to count for three admissions that month. Even though they went to that unit two different times, they went on two different occasions. So suppose you had two events and 50 admissions in that given location and quarter. We're going to look at quarters. Our cumulative admission risk is 2 over 50 or 0 0.04 or 4% for the quarter. And this will be aggregated over time and reported monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, and annually. Our goal is to see these babies the entire length of stay up to day 121. So we're going to be watching these babies through their stay. Time to event analysis. We're going to be able to provide survival probability. So number of neonates without an LOS min event by the number of eligible neonates. So what if you have 24 neonates without any event and 25 of those neonates for a given stay? your survival probability is going to be 96%. So you're going to know that that baby has a 96% probability. Now what's really cool is we're going to be able to take these metrics and calculate them by gestational age, by birth weight category, by NICU acuity. The depth of, of the information that we'll get is going to be phenomenal. So it's really going to give us a good picture of this. So let me know what you'd like to see. If there's any ideas you have or anything, let us know. You can send it to nhsn.gov, just attention Susan. I'd be more than happy to take a look at it. But if there's any kind of measures that you would like to see or like us to show, we'd be more than happy to consider them. And do y'all have any questions? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to introduce this. We'll talk more next year and as time goes on about the protocols, but thank you. Do we have any questions? Susan, we have a, a couple of questions from the web stream participants. Okay. So the first question is, will the neonatal ICU component be a mandatory reporting module? No, it will not. So it, let me just emphasize this will not be mandatory at this time. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, the, I'm sorry. The, the denominator, uh, the crude monthly denominator is... Are, is that going to be looking at number of neonates that are in the unit on the first day of the month plus admissions? Yes. Okay, so well, it, yeah, it's gonna. So it's yeah, it's the like neonates at risk right. for that month. Correct. So you'll go with how many are there on day one, and then add your admissions to that, yes. as opposed to the crude admission one, which is just going to be admissions for the month. I'm trying to distinguish between yeah. these two denominators. So the crude one is going to show us um, 
it's going to be the number of babies that were in that unit that month. So it, it's, uh, it's basically the number of infants that lived and housed in that unit. It's about the same, really. Um, yeah, it's very similar. The two are very similar. So, but what you've got to consider is for the cumulative risk, it's going to be the number of admissions. So, with that said, you're going to have the number of babies for the crude monthly risk. And that's raw number of how many babies lived in that unit. So, I may have had 34 babies that month. Same unit, I might have 45 because I had babies moving in and out. So their admission risk. So I may have the same baby moving in and out of that unit. Does that make sense? It, it's, it's. Go back to your about it because generally these, these units don't have that kind of movement in and out, at least at the level four nursery that I'm familiar with, you know, they don't, they don't move them. Right. Level uh, they might move bed spaces, but they don't move them outside of the unit. So they still would be in that unit. So yeah. that's why I was trying to wrap my head around that. Well, my experience when I've, my NICU experience, we had babies that might be, move out to level two, three, and then they may move back to three, yeah. depending on bed space availability yeah. and criticalness. So they move in and out. So it's actually how many babies were admitted back transferred out, well, how many babies were in that unit and then how many babies were transferred out okay. and then maybe came back in. Okay. So your number's going to be higher for the cumulative monthly risk. Okay. Or the cumulative admission risk, excuse me. Okay. And a couple other questions. One has to do with the CDA interface. Um, what, you're you're going to be doing that with the electronic medical record for the facility. Right. Okay. Is there any precedence right now for doing that with the EMR versus using a vendor software for establishing the CDA? No, no, no. We're going to be working with our vendors, and that's what we're hoping is the vendor software will be able to work with us on that. That's okay. our goal. And one other question, and that relates to antibiotic use. Um, a lot of these neonatal units use prophylactic antibiotics. How are, how are you going to distinguish between those that use, because you're looking at antibiotics prior to the date of the positive blood culture or the CSF, correct? Right. So we'll be looking at those antibiotics over a span of time. So it would be within that two days before and two days after. And what we'll do is make sure that it wasn't given prior to those two days when we pull that data. Okay. All right. Thank uh, and you. we know that there's a lot of them. I mean, they, they live on antimicrobials, so we realize that. Thank you for this. Um, kudos to you all. I think it's great that we're getting some, some NICU-specific uh, data. I'm thinking about questions that I'm going to get from my, my NEOs. Um, we consider late-onset groupy strep usually on day seven or la later, day six later, somewhere in that range. Uh, so this is talking about day three to day 121. Just thinking about that discrepancy kind of of calling something late onset that might occur on day three um, of life compared to some of these other metrics that are considered late onset later on. Any comments, thoughts on, on that or just thinking about, you know, questions that we're going to get asked or I'm going to get asked by, right. by my docs if we're going to call something something. And we built this based on, Vaughn had a measure out there that was very similar to this mm -hmm. and we sort of built and, and expanded from that measure. Uh, and data out there, if you look at research, late onset sepsis is defined as day three or later. Is it? Okay. In the research. So that's why we went with day three or later. Uh, group B strep will not be excluded. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any, we've got excluded organisms per se, but we we don't have exclusions like group, group B strep for this because we want to catch that. We sure. want to see that. Okay. We want to know what's out there. Yeah, thank you. That is for LCBI, yes. That's for LCBI, but that is not That's for not neo this neonatal component. That's yeah. for CLABC, yeah. Day six or later is specific for LCBI. Yeah. Specifically for that 
We're just trying to address a lot of the things that we've heard from our pediatric facilities and trying to help them collect some data and uh, make it meaningful. Any other questions? Well, thank you again for the opportunity.